Thank you all for uh, coming to this uh, State of the uh, ADRC. My name is uh, John Morris, and before uh, we begin, I'd like everyone to take your uh, cell or uh, pager or whatever and uh, put it on vibrate or mute. Uh, also, if you're interested in CME, uh, the CME sign-in sheet is at the very back uh, on this side that you can sign in uh, there. So uh, let me begin with my disclosures. Is everyone able to hear in the back all right? Okay. My disclosures uh, are here. Uh, as you know, most all of our research is supported by uh, funding from the uh, National Institute on Aging. And I have these uh, consulting relationships with, uh, with industry. So it's uh, always uh, instructive uh, for me and uh, really uh, also very uh, pleasurable for me to be able uh, each year to sort of uh, bring uh, the accomplishments and the challenges of the ADRC uh, together once again for a summary report to all of you. And it always strikes me that uh, we are a, a remarkable group of collectively and individually of investigators uh, and staff. It really is remarkable because the strength of the Knight uh, ADRC really uh, are uh, all of us and the people who participate in our research. It's, uh, it, as I say, it's really gratifying each year to come to the same conclusion. I want to just uh, mention our uh, participants. We have about 800. I'll give you some uh, summary statistics on their makeup in, in just a moment. Uh, but they're really a, a, a remarkable and committed group of individuals. Uh, one individual who was enrolled in the very first funding period before we were in ADRC in 1979 and 1981 is still um, completing his annual assessments. Matter of fact, I'm going to be seeing him this uh, Friday at his nursing home where he will have his 31st consecutive uh, annual assessment. So that's really uh, quite remarkable. But even more than their dedication and their commitment, I enjoy meeting almost all of these individuals and interacting with them because they're a delightful group of uh, people. They have uh, wonderful stories and uh, experiences. I learn a great deal about uh, new restaurants in St. Louis from them because they, they eat out frequently. And I really want to encourage all of us at the ADRC to attend the uh, participants meeting. It will be held uh, this year, June the 11th, uh, at the Westport, uh, the Doubletree Hotel in that Westport. Uh, it's not actually in the complex uh, that we think of Westport, but just south of Page. And we have uh, information uh, on, and directions on how to get there. The, I, I want, again, to encourage everybody here, whether you interact with our participants or not, to try to come to this uh, uh, annual meeting. Some of you will be speaking, and I know you will be there. I know the Memory and Aging Project staff will be there. But all of us benefit from the contributions of our participants, whether uh, we're dealing with, uh, with uh, their clinical or cognitive information or their biofluids or their genetic material. Uh, and this is really a chance for us to do two things. One, to give them feedback on the uh, research uh, in which they have participated, but also really it's to thank them. And I, I know that they would enjoy uh, having you come um, and uh, tell them uh, how their contributions have um, have enabled us to do the work that we are doing. So uh, please uh, uh, consider if you are free to come and interact with our participants on June the 11th and we, we will feed you a breakfast uh, in the bargain. Our participants also are really uh, quite uh, supportive not only of the things that they sign up to do, coming in for assessments and images and uh, spinal fluid uh, collection, uh, but they are on call for media and I just uh, uh, and for educational efforts, and I've just listed a few here. Many of our 
participants were featured in uh, national programs, including the Alzheimer Project on HBO and the PBS series on facing the facts about Alzheimer's disease, but almost always they are uh, uh, available also for local media and for teaching uh, students and other, other groups. So they're, uh, again, I, I think we all owe our participants a, a real a debt of, of gratitude. So here are some of their uh, characteristics. This is the older group. Uh, we combine our program project, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, and the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center cohorts into one group. They're assessed identically. And uh, about 500 individuals who we follow annually. I think if you take a look uh, at the very first row, you will see that uh, the majority of our individuals now are clearly cognitively normal individuals. We've shifted, in a way, from being an Alzheimer's disease research center to a, an aging research center because much of our emphasis, of course, is on uh, cognitively normal aging. So you'll also notice that they um, uh, are, uh, in, in this series, about half of them are male, and you'll see that that uh, doesn't hold up in some of our younger series. And uh, they're uh, general of the people who have dementia, about 50% of them carry a, um, an a, at least one copy of the ApoE4 allele. So that's our older group. Here's the adult children's study cohort. Uh, these individuals, as, as you'll recall, are enrolled in two general categories. Uh, the first category, parental history of Alzheimer's disease. And um, the, the parent had to have uh, symptomatic Alzheimer's disease before the age of 80. We wanted 120 individuals. You'll notice that we oversubscribe that because really of the uh, volunteer demand. Uh, many people want uh, very much to um, participate in research because of their experiences with their affected parent. But really all of us should be very proud of this. We wanted 120 people who neither parent had a history of symptomatic Alzheimer's disease and we wanted, uh, we were able to meet that, uh, that enrollment. Now these individuals don't really have much incentive to participate in research, particularly the kind of research we ask of them in the adult children's study with multiple uh, and comprehensive evaluations and longitudinal follow-up. Of course, these people are age 45 to 74 and have jobs and families, and yet they uh, willingly come and uh, participate in our uh, research uh, program. And why would they do that if they did not have a parental history? What is their motivation? So it's, it, it, again, I think it's a real achievement that we were able to, um, to uh, get that full enrollment in these individuals. You notice that maybe, maybe a slightly increased uh, <clears throat> uh, rate of uh, ApoE4 uh, allele carriers in that group. But Again, uh, the people who have a parental history is running around uh, 50 percent, so clearly a different uh, genetic risk in, in these, uh, in these uh, two groups. <clears throat> now, I mentioned we put them through a great deal of, um, of evaluations. Here are the evaluations. They come in for a clinical assessment, a psychometric assessment. They give non-fasted blood to our genetic score, lumbar puncture, uh, structural MR, they undergo an attentional control battery and, and pet PIB, and you see their completion rates at baseline. The, the one that is <clears throat> uh, the least is uh, pet PIB, and that's not because of the willingness of our participants, but we've been dealing with uh, some scheduling issues and so forth to try to catch up uh, that group of individuals. Now, in the original adult children's study, we want to follow people longitudinally every three years on these biomarker studies. And if they still were eligible, still available uh, at three years, you see the middle column indicates how many people came back to complete their evaluation, uh, their procedures at, uh, at three years, and it's still remarkably good. And we can do even better, but it is, uh, is it once again, a dedicated, committed group of individuals, and they come back. 
And there's no difference between those who had a parental history and those who did not. So again, a, a really remarkable uh, group of individuals. And you can come on June the 11th to the Double Tree, and you can thank them for your, this. This is, this is really astounding. This is really remarkable. And then our youngest, uh, our youngest cohort is the dominantly inherited Alzheimer network. Of course, we're one of 10 sites, uh, soon to be 11 sites. Uh, Pittsburgh is joining. And um, we, uh, we have a, 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 the Diane valuation is modeled on the adult children study. And you can see the same similar uh, degree of commitment of, across the Diane uh, cohort. Of course, these people are all from families who, uh, in which there is a pathogenic mutation causing Alzheimer's disease, so they are, really do have incentive uh, to participate, but they do a remarkable job also. And I think that um, um, our Diane uh, study is uh, uh, gaining a great deal of traction, not only among the Diane sites, but uh, many other uh, sites, both who uh, centers who are studying um, autosomal dominant inherited Alzheimer's disease, but also uh, uh, the field at large. They see the value of uh, Diane, and some sites now are wondering whether they can contribute to this uh, Diane study or even become a participating site. And I tell them they're all eligible to come up become a participating site if they pay their own way, because we don't have any more money in our current budget to be able to support that. But all of these uh, sites now are, uh, are uh, groups are interested in participating in one form or another in Diane, including, uh, I put Banner Alzheimer Institute, and I'll come back and talk about them in a little bit, but also the University of Southern California, <clears throat> several sites in Germany and the Netherlands, and then you see uh, others listed as well. And this is, a, this is an uh, incomplete list. I can't, I can't get everyone on here who is interested. But there's a great deal of interest in Diane, uh, uh, not only nationally, but, but of course uh, internationally. So again, with the people uh, as the strength of the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, this is uh, you. And uh, you, as I said, are tremendous group of individuals. It's uh, just a, a real honor for me to be able to come and work with uh, all of you each and every day. So you see that we're interdisciplinary. We're, uh, we have some few men, mostly women, but a few men. And, and we, uh, we are uh, diverse. Any group like this is going to have uh, some squabbles, any family, and we do have some squabbles from time to time, but we are really a team. Uh, we can do better in some things, but uh, we really do work well together. Now, I'm in real danger because I've selected out some of you, not everyone in this room, as collaborators, and of course we're all collaborators, Anytime. I make a list like this, I clearly leave out people who should be included. So if you are a collabor collaborator and don't see your name here, please tell me so I can include you. It's an oversight on my part. And um, so you can, you can see how many people uh, contribute to the scientific and the knowledge of the uh, ADRC. But what's also interesting about this, I'm going to highlight some of the people here who have been part of the ADRC for more than two decades, two decades or more. And it's remarkable uh, how many people have not only contributed to the ADRC over this period of time, but still are, are actively doing so. So you all are really get, um, all of you get uh, great uh, credit uh, and this, uh, this stability and this um, uh, 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 tendency to, to work together and to stay together cohesively over this period of time, again, is another attribute. As I say, I always get concerned that I left somebody out when I've done this, so you look and if you see anybody up here that is, is missing from this group, you let me know about that. And so I will be able to include them in future, um, future uh, listings. 
We've welcomed new uh, members of the team, and again, I apologize if I've left people out, but here are just uh, uh, the people that I, I could think about that have joined us since the last uh, State of the Art, uh, State of the ADRC uh, lecture. Uh, Eric Musiak will be a postdoctoral fellow joining us uh, in July. Because you're such a stellar group of individuals, uh, you have garnered uh, many honors. Uh, again, uh, here's a listing of the ones that uh, I could come up with. And I uh, apologize if I've uh, overlooked some. But uh, Bo Ansis uh, just uh, recently uh, was uh, named the 2011 Coppolo Awardee. Uh, Tammy Benzinger was given a faculty mentorship award. Mary Coates was uh, 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 feted at the um, uh, Hyatt Regency for Excellence in Nursing. Ann Fagan was given the Mensch Award from the National Alzheimer, uh, Alts Forum. Uh, Dave Holtzman was honored by his alma mater with the Merit Award from Northwestern. Terry Hosto was a co-winner of the Friedman Award for um, uh, uh, for excellence in uh, uh, providing uh, support and, and care to the um, uh, geriatric population at Washington University. And Murtis Spencer was given a Lifetime Achievement Award from the uh, Monsanto Family Y. And of course, for those of us uh, in, in academics, uh, uh, steady uh, career uh, development is another way of acknowledging uh, uh, progression and merit and uh, uh, being official this July 1 here are some individuals who are being promoted so Randy Bateman is going to become associate professor of neurology Virginia Buckles research professor as is Ann Fagan uh, Nupur Goshal will become assistant professor of neurology Denise Head associate professor of psychology and Krista Mulder uh, research assistant professor of neurology. So if you have a chance uh, after the uh, uh, program today and haven't had an opportunity to congratulate all these honorees, uh, please do so. One of the things that uh, we're very pleased about in the uh, ADRC is uh, uh, the ability to uh, bring uh, along junior uh, 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 individuals and uh, help them get their career going in uh, research in, uh, in aging and dementia. And uh, here are some of the awardees that we culled from our progress reports beginning in uh, 2004. Uh, it's again, I'm sure, a partial list, uh, and uh, many others could be, uh, could be uh, noted here. But uh, all of these individuals have gone on to establish themselves as um, as really promising and accomplished uh, investigators in their own right. And so we're really uh, pleased to welcome uh, them um, in, their, uh, in their choice of their career. Now you'll notice that some of these individuals uh, come to us from, um, not from within uh, Washington University, but other institutions and particularly uh, foreign uh, institutions. And I just want to a highlight uh, one, Lizzie Behrens, who arrived uh, from Santiago in St. Louis just this past uh, Saturday to um, further her collaboration uh, with the a ADRC. She's uh, working with Nigel and the Neuropathology Corps to identify uh, cerebral tissue for a scientific study that she is interested in. And Lizzie is, is a great example of the um, sort of re, uh, pride that we take in being able to help people along their uh, career development. She really came as a scientist uh, from Santiago in the 1990s to work with Dennis Choi and then began a, col a collaboration uh, with uh, Allison Goat, went back to Santiago uh, after having some time with us in the clinical core of the Alzheimer's Center because she is, is a neurologist and wanted to uh, learn more about dementia and aging. When she got back to Santiago, then she was uh, asked to develop a, a memory uh, uh, clinic, uh, for outpatient clinic and, uh, in, in her institution. So she came back again for a second stint as a visiting scholar 
from 2003 to 2005, and she's continued to uh, contribute her uh, intellect and her energy and her scientific productivity uh, with the ADRC. So uh, Lizzie is here in the audience and we're delighted to have her uh, back and she'll be here working with us uh, all week. So um, we're uh, very productive, I would say, in terms of uh, contributing to scientific literature, 600 publications in uh, peer-reviewed uh, journals uh, over this period of time. Our pilot projects, which is a key index of how well uh, we are able as an ADRC to foster research in, uh, in, at Washington University and beyond, and also our ability to identify uh, promising uh, uh, young talent, uh, I think we've done well. We've funded, uh, since 2004, 25 uh, pilot projects, and we've uh, uh, had them leveraged to uh, bring in an additional uh, 20 million plus in grants, including 13 uh, R01s, as well as another award. So I think that's a, a good barometer of our uh, ability to uh, facilitate uh, research and, and help launch careers. Of course, uh, again, our sample being very well characterized, uh, very um, committed, and because our, uh, uh, our approach to them is very comprehensive in terms of acquisition of imaging data and biofluid data, we get lots of requests from outside uh, uh, investigators as well as those within Washington University for uh, access to the data and the tissue that the ADRC generates with its participants. So here's just a, a listing of this and uh, of how many uh, individuals uh, have uh, been uh, granted requests uh, for access to these uh, data and tissue. Uh, when Randy uh, Buckner was here with uh, Dan Marcus, they decided to uh, take our imaging uh, series and uh, make it freely available in a de-identified way to other investigators, and they call that the Open Access Series of Imaging Studies, and uh, that has generated at least 19 publications. It's hard to tell because no one has to put in a request for this. It's freely available. But we ask people if they are using OASIS data to let us know, and there are at least 19 publications from those data as well from our participants. Uh, the biomarker core not only uh, uh, provides uh, flu biofluid tissue to investigators, it actually has become a, a recognized uh, uh, a center a core of excellence, and many other um, groups now are asking uh, the biomarker core, is led by Ann Fagan, to uh, serve as their biomarker core, including. Um, uh, the Banner Alzheimer Institute and uh, their new initiative, which I'll uh, describe shortly. We're uh, very, uh, very, very uh, gratified uh, that we have, the ADRC has uh, such wonderful partners with, uh, with uh, uh, individuals and groups uh, here at, in St. Louis. I'll talk in a moment about our uh, African American uh, Advisory Board, uh, our partnership with the St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer Association goes back to the beginnings of the association and the ADRC because they both began uh, together and uh, have remained, uh, I think, a really, uh, a, if you will, a model of how an uh, Alzheimer's Disease Center and an Alzheimer's Association chapter can interact in such a legal and productive way. Uh, Terry Hosto and uh, Becky Fierberg co-chair an internal ethics committee for the Knight ADRC and uh, the people who contribute to that again are highly dedicated. Uh, Friedman Center for Aging, uh, St. Louis College of Pharmacy, and I you know I travel around and many of you travel around to other institutions and there are many many uh, really outstanding uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, center programs in the United States and outside of the United States. But we like to think that our program is uh, at the top, if not the very top, uh, again, because of all of you, the, the, the people, but also because of the environment. And I think Washington University has been very special in that regard. Uh, we've never uh, had difficulty getting the support we need from 
from the chancellor uh, to the dean to the department chair of neurology, Dave Holtzman. So we've uh, really been um, benefited by our uh, uh, being at Washington University. And I, I thank, uh, thank the institution uh, and the uh, School of Medicine and the department for their support. As you'll see in a moment, we're also, uh, because of our uh, environment here at Washington University, uh, the beneficiary of uh, charitable gifts. And uh, David uh, Blasingame from Alumni and Development, and particularly uh, David Shear uh, from Alumni and Development, have been very helpful in, in uh, securing some of those uh, gifts for us. And I will just speak now about friends of the uh, Knight ADRC, just a few. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, about a year ago, the, uh, the couple, Charles F. and Joanne Knight, uh, secured the uh, fiscal uh, establishment of the ADRC with an endowment. And it was uh, an endowment that came with the renaming of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center uh, in their name. So now we are officially the Charles F. and Joanne Knight uh, ADRC. Then we had a dedication ceremony in uh, September 1st, uh, 2010 at uh, EPNEC. Uh, here is uh, Chuck Knight and uh, his wife, Joanne, and their family uh, here at that, at that uh, dedication uh, ceremony. And the Knights continue to be uh, really uh, very staunch uh, supporters of our efforts and uh, we're very, very appreciative to them. Uh, we uh, also had another donation from a couple. Uh, uh, we heard about this last October and it became official uh, last, uh, uh, just this past uh, January. A um, uh, very generous gift as well, and you'll see it's uh, been uh, instrumental in allowing, uh, allowing us to continue operations with the adult children's study. Uh, we, for uh, a special reason, as of yet, yeah, we haven't released their names, but uh, so they're sort of anonymous, but uh, I'll tell you if anyone wants to know about them. Um, and uh, as I say, they, they helped the uh, adult children's study uh, immeasurably. I just want to share with you um, a letter. I'll, I'll read it because I know it's so small. You, you, uh, the text is so small you won't be able to. It comes from an adult children's study um, uh, participant. And she uh, entitles this, Dear, in quotation, individual donor, unquote. She goes on to say that her parents both had uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Both were uh, memory and aging project uh, participants. And um, once uh, her father died, uh, he uh, had uh, survived uh, uh, his, his wife, who died earlier, uh, she decided that she wanted to participate, and so she became uh, a member of the adult children's study. And she writes, uh, it therefore was so disappointing to hear in January of this year that the National Institute on Aging did not have the funds to support the renewal of the adult children's study. In fact, at that time, I wrote Dr. Morris offering to do any study, even the dreaded spinal tap, without getting reimbursement. Then came Dr. Morris's exciting letter of March 15th regarding the adult children's study. He wrote, our ability to continue these assessments has been substantially bolstered by extremely generous and most appreciated support from an individual donor, hurrah. Ever since receiving that letter, I've been thinking of you, she's talking to the individual donor, gratefully and prayerfully. I finally have the opportunity to put my feelings in writing. I do want you to know how grateful one of the participants in the study is for you allowing the research to continue. Thank you very much. May you continue to know God as God's blessings. So I shared this with the couple, and uh, they were, of course, very touched that their uh, generosity has been uh, a enabling the, this, this research. Also among our partners, we have an, an African-American advisory board that I think is the model for such boards throughout the Alzheimer's disease uh, center community. Our board is now in its 10th year. It provides uh, much advice on cultural sensitivity and also effective strategies to get the message out to the community at large and to African Americans in particular about the 
need to study Alzheimer's disease in all groups of individuals. Uh, the uh, board members, and they're listed here, are all wonderful and highly accomplished. Um, matter of fact, I think, uh, Jocelyn, is it true that uh, Pastor Petty is in Washington, D.C., or ha just recently was there on, on behalf of the Alzheimer Association to lobby for uh, Alzheimer uh, research? And uh, the founding uh, chair of the, of the uh, uh, advisory board was Norman Say, and I'll mention him in just a moment. Uh, then, uh, when Norman had a stroke, he stepped down from the chair, although, as you see, he remains a member of the board. He was succeeded by Bernice Thompson. And then when Bernice stepped down, uh, the chair is uh, Ida Goodwin Wolfolk, and she's in the back of the room raising her hand, so if you all give her a round of applause for her contributions. Uh, just one uh, update then on the uh, uh, Norman R. Say uh, lecture. We're planning the sixth Say lecture for October the 4th in this room, in this, uh, uh, this uh, auditorium. Uh, we're delighted that Patrick Griffiths, who some of us know well, will, has agreed to become the Say lecturer. You see the predecessors. Uh, and uh, we do this in honor of uh, Norman's uh, great contributions uh, to, uh, to the uh, uh, Knight ADRC. By the way, I'll, I'm sure I will um, get all this information in, incorrect as usual, but on uh, June the 14th at the uh, History Museum in Forest Park, there was going to be a one hour presentation by sixth graders uh, from the City Academy about experiences that have shaped their lives, and they're going to honor uh, many uh, very uh, influential African Americans who have helped shape those experiences, and Norman will be one of those so honored, and I think will be at the uh, History Museum uh, to answer questions. The Breakthrough Ride, uh, I, um, uh, again, another partnership uh, here with the St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, but also the National Association. Uh, Dave Holtzman was, uh, was helpful in getting me to uh, at least pay attention to the possibility that our ADRC would participate in this. I was not enthusiastic at first. I became much more enthusiastic when Krista Mulder said she would do all the work. So then, <laughs> then, then, uh, then we, we started, uh, started organizing, or rather Krista organized it. By the way, uh, e even though I've launched into this, I want to give uh, Krista uh, uh, thanks for her help in putting together uh, this presentation today. So uh, this was a, a, a national uh, ride to raise awareness uh, of Alzheimer's disease and to get Congress to understand uh, the funding uh, necessity. Uh, and we, uh, our ADRC was responsible for the, uh, of the cross-country ride, the segment from Wichita to St. Louis, and you can see it took place in the midst of August last year. It's dark here, but here's uh, Dave, who was a writer, along with Brad Reset uh, from the Department of Neurology, uh, John Cerrito, uh, Jessica Restivo, Tim West, and here's uh, Howard Palmer, and I don't know that you're going to be able in the back to see this, but uh, it, it apparently pays dividends to be a breakthrough writer because you see Howard is surrounded by women. <laughs> All right, so here's our organizational structure. Uh, some of you have seen this. I'm not going to belabor it. We have four multi-component grants that are housed under the umbrella of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The two uh, looking at older uh, individuals, uh, the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center grant, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia. I mentioned the Adult Children Study, which is really parented by the uh, HASD, many of the same projects and, um, and leaders. And then the Diane and the cores that support all of these uh, in the middle. It's, this is unique among Alzheimer's disease centers. No other center has, has one as many 
of these multi-component grants and certainly not as well integrated because they really look at uh, issues uh, regarding uh, how uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, may begin and whether it begins in older adults who are healthy cognitively and if so at what age those changes may begin and you'll see if we can intervene to try to prevent uh, progression to a symptomatic uh, stage of Alzheimer's. Uh, I'm not going to belabor these, but all of these are just my uh, uh, quick uh, a selection of some of the um, <clears throat> notable publications. Which, as you see, we have many notable publications every year, but I put up uh, one about uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease because I think this really is a uh, a testament to the integration of our, uh, of our program where we can look not only at people who are cognitively normal in terms of imaging and molecular imaging but also in terms of their uh, CSF uh, values for <coughs> proteins A, A beta and tau and also their genetic uh, profile so we, we can really look at this quite comp comprehensively. Uh, can uh, CSF biomarkers themselves uh, or with uh, measures of structural MR uh, look uh, at uh, classifying people? Do we really need to go through uh, arduous uh, clinical assessments or can we make uh, decisions based on biomarkers alone? And Kathy Rowe and colleagues uh, pr uh, published on that recently. Uh, from uh, <clears throat> Dave and uh, his lab, uh, uh, and Rick Perrin and uh, Ann Fagan and others, uh, Rebecca Craig Shapiro and Rowan Tarana have looked at new uh, biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid, uh, YKL40 and VILIP1. And these are, are uh, pushing uh, then our capability to look at, uh, at uh, changes uh, that may reflect the Alzheimer pathology. From Randy Bateman's lab, uh, the question is whether Alzheimer's disease in late life is a, a matter of overproduction of uh, amyloid beta or of decreased clearance, and he's been able, again, in our really, really dedicated uh, cohort to determine that uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease or late onset Alzheimer's disease is characterized by decreased clearance. Uh, Denise Head's lab uh, looked at uh, exercise, and uh, the more you exercise, the less likely you are to have a positive PIP scan. Uh, Jim Galvin, uh, uh, although he now is at New York University, uh, was able to use ADRC data to look at how well this brief two-minute two questionnaire, uh, informant questionnaire that indicates the likelihood so, uh, someone is demented, to find that it very closely uh, links to uh, Alzheimer biomarkers. That is, it appears the people who are detected uh, as being demented by um, the AD8 are very likely to have Alzheimer biomarker uh, signature. And then Dave Holtzman with Allison Goat wrote a really uh, very comprehensive review about uh, Alzheimer's disease in the 21st uh, century. So these are some of the um, some of the accomplishments and some of the partners and some of the people. We do have challenges, and there are two very big challenges. One is our renewal application for it, what arguably is our most exciting study, the adult children's study, it was scored very well, but as we all know, was not funded. So we've had a really intense six months. Uh, when we found it wasn't funded, we revised the original renewal application to try to incorporate the few critiques that the reviewers found with it. It was funded, uh, as you score, excuse me, scored in the third percentile, so there weren't many. And we resubmitted then a revised renewal application, program project application, in late January. We immediately then started another grant application that went in the first of March. Now, I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then we took the individual R01 projects that were in the ACS renewal project and we're just about ready to submit them in a few days. So uh, within six months, we've had a 
P01, a U01, and four R01s, and it's been, as I say, very intense. So what happened to the ACS? Well, we're on a no-cost extension, so we're still a viable grant. The grant hasn't ended because of the no-cost extension. We're very likely to get bridge funding, at least for a year. It won't be much, but the NIA will give us some funds to maintain the cohort. And then we've been, uh, again, very, very fortunate to get additional funds to allow the ACS cohort to remain uh, intact. So uh, the Department of Neurology, under Dave's uh, guidance, contributed uh, funds to make sure that the biomarker core remained intact. We've used funds from Charles F. and Joanne Knight. Uh, we were successful in applying to the McDonnell Center for Systems Neuroscience to help our imaging project. And I mentioned our uh, benefactors, uh, which uh, one of the ACS co uh, uh, cohort members uh, thanked. Uh, they allow us to have about um, uh, $200,000 a year for the next five years with their $1 million gift to uh, maintain the ACS cohort. So we're still functioning. We can't do some of the biomarkers that are expensive. That's why we're submitting the four R01s to try to uh, be able to cap capture grant funds to do that. But we're still seeing all of our participants uh, longitudinally and even recruiting a few to uh, maintain the sample. So the reason it wasn't funded, we think, is not because we didn't have a good application. We think we did. We think there are challenges at the National Institutes of Health and particularly disproportionately at the National Institute on Aging. So they're right now funding up to the six percentiles percentile. Uh, P01 grants are not going to be uh, scored in general, but they're going to be thrown together and scored against themselves. And it's going to be harder to submit large grants, R01s, P01s, even center grants. The, um, because of the funding crisis, the uh, NIA is uh, discouraging large grants, defined as greater than $500,000 a year in the first year of direct costs. Of course, our ACS program project was something like $2 million. So this, this is going to be problems not only now, but for the future. I think we have to keep this in mind, that the era of having four large multi-component grants is unlikely to be replicated. I hope I'm wrong, but we have to be creative how we're going to go forward. Uh, we uh, are going to be faced with this pretty soon because next year we have to start planning the renewal of HASD. Because HASD and ACS are closely linked, one of the things that we've begun to discuss is whether we can combine them uh, into a single grant and strengthen, uh, strengthen the package more than either would be alone. We'll have to think more about that. Let me tell you at least my thought about how the major themes of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center have evolved over the uh, 26 years that it has been funded. Uh, Phil Miller is here so he can um, correct or ampl amplify on any of this. But we really began with the program project, HASD, which was a naturalistic study of mild senile dementia of the Alzheimer type in comparison with healthy aging. So to characterize mild senile dementia of the Alzheimer type and healthy aging needed a classification device and that then uh, grew the clinical dementia rating. Originally it was going to rate no dementia, CDR0, and mild dementia, but clearly it became, uh, quickly it became evident that there were some people that were neither clearly normal nor clearly demented and so that that gave birth to the rating CDR 0.5, questionable dementia. It became uh, uh, clear in a case study and then a somewhat larger study in the uh, f first few years after we started using CDR 0.5 that, that that rating of questionable dementia can indicate people who had very mild dementia of the Alzheimer type, not only from their clinical presentation but also uh, buttressed by their neuropathologic findings. 
So CDR 0.5, we began to understand, could indicate very mild dementia of the Alzheimer type. Now, we're still trying to characterize the mildest changes of, of dementia of the Alzheimer type in contrast to healthy aging. And other people were looking at this also. They used a different terminology. Instead of very mild or very early stage, they used the term mild cognitive impairment. Really grew out of a, a program at NYU, but it was uh, popularized and operationalized by the Mayo Clinic group led by Ron Peterson. And they decided to use uh, this CDR to indicate that uh, stage of MCI. Here, by 1996, uh, we thought that at least our approach to identifying individuals in the CDR, CDR 0.5 stage who were likely to have very early dementia of the Alzheimer type, we were sufficiently confident about that that we decided to change the terminology uh, descriptor for CDR 0.5 from questionable dementia to very mild DAT. And so for the past 15 years, we've been using that terminology. It's been difficult because the rest of the field doesn't use that terminology. They have a very different assessment approach, and so they can't have the same sort of information base that we have to make that diagnosis. That's created some problems for us, but I think eventually the field is moving at least in our way because now new criteria for MCI suggest that you should diagnose MCI due to Alzheimer's disease, which is essentially very mild dementia of the Alzheimer type. We also, in this 1996 paper, talked about presymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. So that's our second major theme. In the 1990s, I think we moved, since, since we, think, we thought by then that we knew we could characterize the CDR 0.5 people who had very mild DAT, now we decided to look at individuals who didn't have dementia, didn't have, even at the 0 0.5 level, their CDR0, but they had the pathologic changes. And so a series of studies led primarily by Joel Price uh, culminated in our next major theme, that is the characterization of Alzheimer's disease in cognitively normal people. And again, new criteria uh, have, uh, have accepted that uh, concept uh, pre that there is a preclinical stage of Alzheimer's. We've been working on this for, for 20 years and glad to see the field now is catching up with us. So, so the problem with a theme on preclinical Alzheimer's disease is we have to wait, we had to wait until people died and we could look and see the neuropathology in the, in the postmortem brain tissue. So the third theme, that I, and I think we're still in this uh, er, era now, is to look at uh, biomarkers to detect preclinical Alzheimer's disease in vivo. And I think 1997 was an important year in this. Uh, Dave Holtzman began his uh, biofluid collection, CSF collection. And uh, that was also the first year that I was the principal investigator of, uh, uh, for the renewal application for healthy aging and senile dementia. And I uh, decided that we needed to do imaging. We'd started out with imaging, Mukhtar Gatto, uh, Mark Rakel in the 1980s, but the next several uh, renewal applications didn't have an imaging project. And we brought in uh, Randy, ba uh, Randy Buckner to, uh, to head an imaging study in that renewal application along with uh, the Dave's um, uh, CSF studies. And then in the next renewal cycle, uh, Randy uh, then moved his project into an imaging core. That's why the imaging core is in HASD, is because we resurrected the imaging study through that. So these are the biomarker areas in general that we evaluate. Of course, we're always looking for new, new ways to uh, pursue this to identify uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease in cognitively normal people. Now I think a challenge for all of us is where do we go next? So, the field gradually is coming to realize that MCI is caused, at least in many cases, by Alzheimer's disease. They accept the preclinical stage, so where do we go next? Well, here are some ideas. These are only ideas, and uh, they come from me, so they're probably not very good. Um, and I'm very I'm encouraging all of you to contribute to this. I think our biggest impact, and of course one that we would like to see realized, is prevention trials. 
And Randy's working very hard in the Diane cohort to initiate and launch prevention trials, but we're not alone. So that Alzheimer Prevention Initiative, I'll come again, come back to it in just a moment, is about to launch also, we think. And then the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study is going to uh, put in its renewal application due this fall a proposal to do anti-amyloid in asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you count anti-amyloid, asymptomatic Alzheimer's, there are four A's, so they're calling this the 4A project. So that would be great. I mean, it would be terrific to have prevention trials, and if that's our new direction for the future, uh, couldn't think of anything better. <clears throat> I still think we have to look at the impact of preclinical Alzheimer's disease, however, on traditional concepts of aging because I think uh, aging may be, what people think about aging, may be influenced uh, much more than people think about the presence of preclinical Alzheimer's. I'll try to show you an example. And then always, of course, uh, to get the best uh, agents to, to try to prevent or cure Alzheimer's disease, we need to understand much better uh, Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. So let me talk just a bit about the prevention trial in Diane. Uh, Randy is convened the Clinical Trials Committee. <clears throat> it's been meeting for over a year. Um, <clears throat> and um, 10 compounds uh, for prevention, potential pre prevention trial have been nominated by nine different pharma uh, companies. And uh, Randy is moving the CTC, the Clinical Trials Committee, into a therapeutic trials unit that would actually conduct the study of a prevention uh, pre in the Diane cohort. For this, we're doing several other things in Diane, a, a forum wherein members of families who have mutations are able to talk confidentially with one another, and a registry, and this will be members of families who would be candidates to participate in Diane, but for whatever reason do not, but they might be interested in participating in clinical trials, and that registry is going to be announced at the, at the Paris ICAD in July. All right, I mentioned the Alzheimer Prevention Initiative. This comes from uh, Eric Ryman and Pierre Terrio at Banner Alzheimer's Institute in, uh, in Phoenix. And th they've been planning for some time an R01 application to the National Institute of Aging that would give them the platform to conduct a prevention trial. In addition, they have support from pharma and from philanthropy We've been interacting with them for some time, a year and a half at least, if not longer, and we've <clears throat> encouraged their, um, their interaction with the largest known uh, familial Alzheimer's disease uh, kindred in, in Antioquia, Colombia, led by Francesco Lopera, we interacted with uh, 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 Allison and, and many others of us uh, uh, several years ago in uh, and uh, that, that kindred is where uh, Eric and Pierre were going to launch their prevention trial. And we encouraged and helped support that. And they were going to encourage and help support Diane in launching its prevention trial in the United States, England, and Australia. So about two weeks ago, Eric and Pierre said, well, we're also going to launch this trial in U.S. families, which, of course, is a direct threat to Diane because if they launch their prevention trial and Diane family members or if Diane participants join, then that's going to leave very little, uh, very few individuals for us, so a direct threat. So it's been another ad added intensity in the past two weeks to try to work out not competition but collaboration, and we think we have a collaboration with them. We're going to actually go in with them on their grant as uh, the site management organization for their trial in the U.S. The ADCS will be involved. And we hope uh, Dave and Ann are going to play a role, and uh, Randy and myself, and we hope this truly will be a collaboration. However, I still would say that we would have the best success not simply in collaborating with them in their U.S. component of their prevention trial, but by launching ours first. Okay, just a 
few minutes left, I want to talk about preclinical Alzheimer's disease and concepts of aging. So most people think that with age, cognitive abilities decline. Here's uh, work from Martha, Jim Galvin, and, and, uh, and David Johnson showing if you take out from a healthy aging population all people who began cognitively normal, take out the people who later are found to have dementia, that is they had preclinical Alzheimer's, cognitive aging really could be quite stable. That's one. Two, driving. You can't see this, or maybe you can, but people who were CDR 0.5, CDR 1, and safe to drive at initial evaluation, they f become unsafe to drive within about two years. Well, that's interesting, but look at this. What about people who were safe to drive and were CDR 0? They also become unsafe to drive. Is that because a proportion of them have preclinical Alzheimer's disease? That would be suggested by work that Susie Stark and others are doing about propensity to fall. If you take out the people who have preclinical Alzheimer's disease as identified by PIP scan, they fall to the PIP positive cognitive normal people fall at a much higher rate than individuals who do not have PIP. So I think preclinical Alzheimer's disease really uh, gives aging a bad name. It impairs people more than truly healthy aging uh, should do. Well, I just have a minute left, so I just want to talk about that U01 grant that we put through. And uh, I guess it went in in early March. Uh, it's in response to a program announcement. Jeff Milbrand, Dave Holtzman are the PIs. It's to take current genetic information and about risk for disease and give it to individuals and say, here's your genetic risk, now how is this going to change your medical care? Well, m many of the, uh, most of this was targeted towards cancer risk, but we decided because the ADRC is so well established, Jeff Milbrandt came to us and said, let's do it on, in Alzheimer's disease because you have such a, a wonderful organization, such a remarkable cohort. So here are the makeup then of the, um, of the grant, three projects, and it went in uh, March 3rd, and I guess we'll hear in a few months whether it's accepted or not. And Krista Mulder put this together at the request of the uh, in Institute for Clinical Translational Sciences about uh, how, uh, what, what is a program here at Washington University that demonstrates the, uh, the uh, spectrum from basic science or translational research and practice and uh, innovation that changes practice, and again, it's uh, complicated, but you can see that uh, within the ADRC, there's a remarkable group of uh, individuals that have done this over, over all of these different areas and interacted in, in many different ways. It's a really, again, a tribute to, the, to all of you in the ADRC for how, uh, how broad, and, uh, broad and how deep we are. And then again, with the uh, St. Louis uh, chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, uh, we've participated in the Alzheimer's State Plan Task Force uh, that Governor uh, Nixon uh, now has, and we hope it will restore a pilot grant uh, program. So just uh, two, two slides left. Uh, I, I presented this last year. I don't mean to be uh, so um, uh, uh, um, projecting what I think on you, but I'm going to do it anyway. So. Um, I think we should all agree on these concepts. Uh, I think we all agree, but I think we should. When we use the term Alzheimer's disease, we're talking about the brain disorder. It has two, the disease has, the brain disorder has two major stages. This preclinical disease that we've been talking about, it's been a major theme, and if you, you want to use pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, that's fine, but most of us are using preclinical. Then there's a symptomatic phase. And the symptomatic phase is really a matter of severity. Early on, it's hard to tell, no question. You can call it incipient, you can call it prodromal, you can call it mild cognitive impairment, but it is the symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's disease. And then there's what everyone would agree is dementia. And this makes sense pathobiologically, because what happens in Alzheimer's disease is not that you convert from cognitive normality to MCI, and then you convert from MCI to dementia, it's a progressive course, progressive neuronal deterioration. 
And the way we detect it, and why we can detect it, I think, better than other methods, is because we look at the principle of intra-individual decline. That's most important. So I'd like us all to utilize terminology and concepts, concepts when we're talking so we don't give mixed messages in our, in our publications. And my last slide is just really to acknowledge those that have gone before us and really established all this. It uh, uh, wouldn't have happened without the efforts of uh, many, many people. And again, I, I'm sure I'm missing uh, uh, critical individuals, but just want to uh, give thanks to uh, the people who have gone before us, including the founding director of the uh, ADRC and his colleagues, Dick Torak, Charles Hughes, Jack Botwinick, and Martha Sturant, and the, uh, you see the enablers there. So thanks very much, and if there are questions, be happy to try to answer them.